What's up, beautiful ladies and handsome men? I am not sure what's true or false in this story. I take gossip, tea, rumor, and scandal from yesteryear, from online, from word of mouth, from books, and I ball it up and I tell you guys a story. Now, let's get to it. And baby, listen at this. If you ain't out here using Brio Geo Don't Despair Repair Deep Conditioning Mask, honey, you headed to a skippy dried out head. This is a best-selling five-time Allure Beauty Award winning weekly treatment that strengthens damaged hair and helps prevent further damage. Baby, this hair mask is clinically proven to decrease hair breakage after only two uses, honey. Because while I've been sitting up here smiling and cheesing all in the camera, child, I didn't know that my hair was dry as the Sahara Desert, honey, until I used the product and felt the difference. And that is why you guys should go and take Brio Geo's hair quiz and see what products they have made for you. Go and answer them questions and let them folks get your hair right. And y'all already know I got y'all covered. BrioGeo.com is offering you guys 15% off. All you have to do is click my link and use my code, Ashley says so, and get clean hair that actually works. Now, Pat, eh? we've asked you more than once to sing the song the other way. We don't know what you're doing, but we don't like it. Now you hold it right there, Hoss. No, no, Jimmy, I won't hear no more of your whining or no more of your complaining. Now I sing the song that you boys want me to sing, but one thing's got to be laid straight flat across the line, and that is that I'm going to sing the song my way. I go out walking after midnight out in the moonlight just like we used to do. I'm always walking after midnight searching for you. I stop to see a weeping willow crying on his pillow. Maybe he's crying for me. And as the skies turn gloomy, the night winds whisper to me, I'm lonesome as I can be. I go out walking after midnight, out in the starlight, just hoping you may be somewhere a walking after midnight, searching for me. Ooh, yeah. Let's move on and get to Miss Patsy Klein. Virginia Patterson Hensley was born in Winchester, Virginia on September the 8th, 1932. Her father's name was Samuel Lawrence Hensley and her mother's name was Hilda Hensley. And her mother was actually only like 16 years old at the time while her father Sam, I believe was around 42 years old. Now as a young girl, Patsy's name was actually Jenny, which was short for Virginia. But because I don't wanna confuse anybody, I'm just gonna call her Patsy throughout this. And this child, was born with a spicy, spicy attitude, honey. Baby, the folks say that one time her mama took her to a shoe store and she went off on the shoe store lady. Patsy wanted some Mary Janes and the shoe store lady was, she was lifting up all these shoes. How about this one? How about that one? Patsy was just standing there looking at her and finally was like, I said, I want the Mary Jane. And not only was Patsy sure about her Mary Janes, she also was very, very sure that she would grow up to be a country music star. And her mother and her father may have wanted to support her, but baby, at this moment, they didn't have time to. Every time you turned around, Sam Hensley was somewhere talking about some whip. Guess it's time to move again. Well, guess it's time to go to Texas. Go here, go there. Sir, sit your tail down somewhere. But they say the reason he was moving like that is because he was always looking for a better job or better opportunity. But then like as soon as he would start the job, he was ready to go somewhere else. So eventually all this moving around brought the family right back to Winchester where they started. And the family was not any richer than they were starting out. So Patsy ended up getting a job at a chicken plant. She was only 13, but she lied to say she was 16. But see, Patsy thought she was gonna be packaging the chicken. She didn't know what to think when she showed up and them folks had her slaughtering the chickens as well as plucking them. But she did what she had to do. And then Sam and Hilda, they was running up, you know, great job, thank you so much for helping out your parents. You're the greatest child ever. And then was sitting up there looking crazy when Patsy ended up about to die. Baby, the folks say that she had caught some kind of horrible throat infection and she ended up with rheumatic fever. It was so bad that she had to stay at the hospital inside of an oxygen tent for several weeks. 
Patsy ended up pulling through and she discovered that the throat infection and the rheumatic fever had altered Patsy's voice. And so after she healed a bit and she opened her mouth to sing, they could not believe the syrupy, the uh, fire-tinged voice that came out of this young girl's mouth. It was very mature and it was very strong and the best thing about it is that it was unique. And so now Patsy wants to sing more than ever. But before she could take the first step, her family suffered another blow, and that is when Hilda got tired of saying, I'm doing too much. I was trying to move and leave and all that kind of stuff. Baby, they said Sam was like, well, come on, let's go. Hilda told him, F you, buddy. I'm not going no doggone where because she wanted to make a life for herself and her children. So anyways, gossip claims when Sam did leave that Patsy did not see him again for uh, seven years until she visited him on his deathbed. But child, most folks surprised she went to visit him then, honey, because see, these these messy old Hollywood scandalous street says that actually Patsy's father had been molesting her. Now you got some folks saying that this was a one-time thing and then you got other folks saying that this was a constant thing. I don't know which one is true but I do know that gossip claims that it's very true that he did molest his daughter at least sometime. So when the family split up, gossip claims that Patsy was around 14 years old and she had no choice but to help her mother. She quit school, she ended up going to work for Greyhound and I think she also worked for a drugstore. Some people even said that she did a few waitressing jobs. Now with all of this on your head, most people would be too bogged down to go chasing some sort of dream, but not Patsy. So one day she walked straight into WINC radio station and told them that I want to be your new girl singer. And the folks was like, girl, take your curly head on somewhere. But then Patsy said, I'll do it for free. You don't have to pay me. Next thing you know, she was on the mic auditioning. And then soon after that, she was the newest girl singer singer at that radio station. Along with this, she also started appearing in talent contests and also she ended up uh, doing a nightclub show. But obviously just singing over the radio is not gonna just shoot somebody into big country fame. She wanted to get to the Grand Old Opry. So she wrote a letter to the Grand Old Opry asking them for an audition and then they sent a letter back asking her for a headshot. Patsy took her little pictures and she sent them on over and while she was waiting to be looked over, something that must have seemed like a blessing from heaven ended up happening. Famous gospel singer Wally Fowler was coming to town and getting ready to put on a show. And Patsy knew that if she could impress Wally Fowler, he would put in a good word for her with the folks of the Grand Ole Opry. So she goes to his show and then she found uh, one of her friends who was like a ticket booth person or something like that. And they snuck her backstage. And when she got back there, she saw how holy, upright, and saintly Wally Fowler was. Honey, that man snapped at Patsy real quick. What do you want, gal? And Patsy was like, well, sir, I want to audition for you, sir. Look, little gal, I got a show to do. Get out of here. But Patsy would not give up. She kept pushing and begging and asking for an audition. And Wally was finally like, okay, gal, you got your audition. And Patsy is like, yes, yes. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. Thank you. That's how she was standing there looking. And Wally Fowler was looking at her like, little gal, what is wrong with you? I said audition. And Patsy is like, oh my gosh, oh, you mean sing right now. And then Wally was like, yeah, unless you can't sing. Patsy put those hands on her hips and she opened her mouth and she went to town, honey. And next thing you know, Wally Fowler jerked her arm up marched her out on that stage and introduced her as his new discovery. And Wally Fowler did exactly what she asked. He put in a good word for her to go to the Grand Ole Opry. They told her that her singing was not it, honey. But Patsy was not deterred. She went back to Winchester and continued singing over the radio. She was already doing uh, talent shows. Now she added in singing at social events. She sang at hotels. She sang at bars. She sang wherever someone would have her. She looked at herself as a real female entertainer, a real female singer and so you had to dress like a real female singer you had to act and move like a real female singer and everybody knows female singers have a lot a lot of fun and what child you should have seen the look on the town's women faces, honey, when Patsy would come walking down their road, what with her short shorts on, her hot pants. She liked her sweaters to be tight and very form-fitting. She would have on her peep toe heels or her cowboy boots. And honey, if you wanted her to put on the dress, you better make sure, honey, that that dress was squeezing all on her hips, rubbing and hugging all her curves. She would wear big, bold, red lipstick, and she would have these long, dangling earrings on. 
You know, she really wanted to shock people, and she also wanted to catch a man's eye. And she was only around 15, 16, uh, 14, really, doing all of this, so people didn't know what to make of Patsy. And then what shook them up even more is if they snickered and kind of whispered when she walked by, Patsy would just look at them, <laughs> smile, and keep on walking, baby. She knew she was fine, and if they didn't like it, then to heck with them. And all Patsy really hung around was guys, and it was because she did want to be a singer, and the country music business was dominated by men until Patsy Cline came along. I mean, they had a few female entertainers here and there, but Patsy Cline was the one who changed the game. And not only was she around boys and men because she wanted to catch their attention and because she wanted to sing, she was more like a dude herself. She acted like a boy. What? What's up, Hank? You know what I'm saying? You hear somebody talking like that, you expect it to be a guy, it's Patsy. She walking around slapping folks on the back of the back, you know, what you drinking there, boy? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> she was just a brash female. And the other females were just not like this. You know, they were too prissy, trying not to mess up, trying not to say the wrong thing. They standing up straight like a pencil, looking crazy and all this kind of stuff. No, Patsy felt like that was too uptight. Now, Patsy's wild ways and her love for men may have come from the trauma she suffered as a child, but if it did, Patsy was not letting on, honey. She was very much one of these females like Billie Holiday. You know, they were really tough girls. Patsy was not the type of female that would say, you know, oh, because of this is why I'm doing this. She did what she did, and that was the end of it. And the things she did was a scandalous thing, child. Well, it was scandalous to other folks, but it was not scandalous to Patsy. She was just living her life. And when we're talking about the steamy side of things, don't you think for a minute that she couldn't walk through that door and steal your man? She was not much of a looker, but her attitude, her personality, and the way she carried herself, she had massive, massive sex appeal. And it didn't matter if a man was young or old, baby, they fell at her feet just the same. And then, child, Patsy was cold-blooded, honey. Oh, she loved them and left them all the time. Huh. Child, a man come up to Patsy talking about some Patsy darling. Why you ain't call me back? I thought we had something. Baby Patsy would be like, uh, you thought like lick. I just wanted the so she was really, really something else. And even Patsy herself had no problem admitting that she was this type of female. I read somewhere that she was doing an interview with somebody and they were asking about her old days or something like that. And she was like, well, and when it was time for me to get off work, my mama would always come and get me every night. She never trusted me with nobody. And then she goes on to say, but shoo, knowing me back then, I wouldn't have trusted me with nobody either, honey. Patsy's first boyfriend was a man named Jimbo Rinker. Now, gossip claims that Patsy was about 14 years old at this time, and Jimbo Rinker, I think, was like 25 years old. And some people say that Jimbo Rinker was married, but I didn't see that anywhere. So they dated for a little while, and then Patsy left him hanging and went on to somebody else. Left that person hanging, went on to somebody else. And then as the years started to pass by, Patsy started to realize that men felt this way about her. You know what I'm saying? And so she she quickly stopped sleeping with men just because she felt like they was fine or just because she liked them or something like that. And she figured that she can use her vavoom or her oomph to get what she really wanted, stardom. So she took her moves down to see the local band leader, Bill Pierce. And when he heard Patsy sing, he told her, hey gal, what's your name, Virginia? Oh, Virginia, you are wonderful. You really blew my socks off. Gal, you impressed the heck out of me. And Patsy turns around and says, me or my singing? And Bill Pierce should have just said, you're singing. But instead, he said both. And this set Bill and Patsy off on a road to all kind of woo childness, honey. So all of this happens around the year of 1951. She's 19 years old and Bill Peer is another man that's 11 years older than her. And Patsy starts to sing with Bill Peer's band. And Patsy was Bill's standout gal. He was actually the one that changed her name from Virginia to Patsy because he felt like Virginia was just like not star quality. So for a minute she was going around as Patsy Hensley. So anyways, this man works his fingers to the bone for Patsy. He takes all of his savings and he puts it all on her needs. He also accrues a ton of debt, you know, because he's always greasing palms everywhere, paying folks under the table to get her better gigs, to get her better material so her mother can make her better clothes. Just any way that he can help her, he's doing it. And he does all of this because he feels like she is his Patsy. And it was easy for him to feel like that because gossip claims that right after she auditioned, probably like a week after that, she started sleeping with Bill Pierre. So all Bill Pierre thought 
thought about day and night was him and Patsy. You know, they were Bunny and Clyde. Well, the folks say that somebody came up to Bill Pierre and told him, you need to be careful with that Virginia girl. She's the love them and leave them type and she will leave you with nothing. And while this person was telling him this, you know, he really couldn't do anything except kind of like stare at the ground and then stare back at them in their face because the person telling him was his doggone wife. And if he would have said anything, confirming that he was having an affair with Patsy, baby, she would've bust that man all upside his doggone head. In fact, not only was Bill Peer very married, he also had a young son. But regardless of what his wife said, Bill Peer was gone. He was a lovesick dog, honey. On the days that he could not get away from his wife or he could not get to Patsy, he would just sit around moping. And it was this behavior right here is what really started causing problems. Bill Peer may have been wrapped up in Patsy, but the town of Winchester was not especially when they found out that she was sleeping with a married man. Oh, honey, the women didn't like that, honey. And of course, the men of the town, whether they really cared or not, uh, you know, they weren't going to go against their wife. So they was going to be sitting up there talking about some look at old stankin' tail, messing around with everybody men. They was going to say that too. It got so bad where people were not just whispering and snickering their contempt for Patsy anymore. They were just downright saying stuff out loud. Now, they wouldn't say it to her face. <laughs> Baby, they weren't that crazy. They weren't finna say it to her face. But, you know, still, she started to notice that her loose reputation was threatening her chances to be a star. So Patsy was like, something gotta change, doggone it. Ain't nothing finna mess me up. And that change was a man by the name of Gerald Klein. Patsy married this Gerald Klein trying to make herself look better and be more respectable. But child, Gerald Klein walked in here looking like her great uncle from her seventh cousin, Grandma Si. I don't know if that makes sense, but y'all get what I'm trying to say. So when she premiered her new man, everybody was like, nah, uh-uh, baby. Now she knows she wrong. Then married that man for his doggone money. Woo! The scandal, child. The scandal. And baby, the bad thing about it is that the scandal was kind of true. Not only did Patsy uh, marry Gerald because of his good name, she married him because his family was said to have money. But catch this tea for y'all teapots. Gossip claims that Patsy really wasn't going to marry Gerald Klein. She was actually just going to date him and try to, you know, probably get him to finance her a little bit. But when Patsy told that man that she would not marry him, he pulled out a gun and uh, threatened to commit suicide if she did not marry him. So Patsy felt like she had to. But honey, she probably was wishing she would have wrestled that gun out of his doggone hands when after they got married, she found out that Gerald really didn't have money the way she thought he did. So the year is now 1953. Patsy has just gotten married to Gerald. And when Bill Peer found out that Patsy had gotten married, he cried and he moped. So Patsy said, come here, Bill. And she gave him some of that good stuff just for old time's sakes. But the thing is, if Patsy thought that this was gonna be a goodbye pook, oh baby, she had lost her dog on mine. Bill Peer wasn't going for that. So Patsy found herself juggling two men and child of folks on the street say it was a doggone shame what was going on with them folk. Honey, the folks say that Gerald Klein would go to work early in the morning. About 10 minutes later, Bill Peer would come and park his car like a block away and then he would walk up to Patsy's apartment and be with her all day. Then they said that Gerald would get up and drop her off at rehearsal, but there was no rehearsal to be found. Bill Peer would just pull up to wherever she was. She would get in his car. They would go off and do their thing. And then, honey, listen at this. So Gerald has gone to work, child, and Bill Peer Pierre has showed up to Patsy's apartment and they are just wrapped up in the throes of love and passion so they do not hear it when Gerald's car pulls up. Baby Gerald got to walking up them steps. Patsy almost jumped out her skin, child. She almost knocked Bill out and everything. She pushed him up under that doggone bed, told him, you better shut your mouth, horse and then she took his clothes and put it in the closet somewhere. And so when Gerald walks in the house, you know he all looking around. What you been doing, Patsy? Up. Uh Nothing. I ain't been doing nothing. I just been, you know, straightening up around here and things like that. Well, why you got your slip on, Patsy? Well, now, Gerald, you know I wasn't going anywhere today. Is it a crime for a woman to wear her slip around the house? What? I guess not. I'm just gonna go lay here across this bed and take a quick nap. And child, they said the springs of the bed was poking Bill Pierre all in his naked booster child. Well, about 15 minutes later, uh, Gerald had actually fallen asleep. So that is when Bill Pierre came from up under the bed, grabbed his clothes out of the closet, and came flying down the stairs, ran a block away to where his car was parked, and drove away. Now, on the career side of things, Patsy was still singing with Bill Pierre, and then she ended up winning a local country music contest, which gave her $100 and a chance to perform regularly 
on Cunny B. Gay's Town and Country Time show. But this show was shot in Washington, D.C., and Gerald, her husband, was not about to take her down there because Gerald honestly didn't really want Patsy singing anymore anyway. He wanted her to become more of a housewife. And then in 1954, Bill Peer was finally able to give Patsy what he had promised her a couple of years ago and what he had been trying to do forever, a record deal. And the record label was called Four Star Records. And child, Bill Peer was proud as heck that he'd gotten his Patsy this record deal. In fact, he was so happy that when it was time for Patsy to go down and sign for the record deal, uh, they asked her and her husband, Gerald Klein, to come, you know, so they could take the pictures and all of that kind of stuff. Bill Peer was so doggone happy that he actually went down there with them. But child, when Patsy finally got a good look at the contract she signed, baby, that woman probably swung on Bill Peer. The most that she was gonna make out of any profit was like 2%. The record label was going to take the rest. And then on top of the bum, money deal, the record label also demanded and required that Patsy sing the songs that they wanted her to sing, nothing else. Honey, I imagine that Bill Pierce stopped smiling and ran out of that doggone building so fast, jumped in his car, drove home, walked in the house, and right into a slap in the face, honey. Because his wife, Jenny, had found out that Bill and Patsy had been carrying on for a long time. They said that she said he was a sorry SOB lower than a low down dirty dog and that would be the last time that he would embarrass her she wanted a divorce and bill did the little bitty act you know he wanted to act like he was you know scared about losing his family and that he loved his wife so much but gossip on the street says that in the inside bill was jumping for joy because he was truly in love with patsy and he also felt like he was in luck because in the weeks after Bill's wife, Jenny, asked for the divorce, Patsy and Gerald's marriage started going downhill as well. So since Bill Peer knows this, every time he sees Patsy, he's always asking her to marry him. Leave Gerald, marry me. And she'd say, well, there's just no way on this earth, Bill, that I can marry you. And then she'd say, oh, but you know, Bill, you know, Gerald is just not what I need him to be. No, he don't support me. I need my own transportation. I want my own car and bill of course is like that's it that's it i'ma buy my baby a car and once i give her that she's gonna marry me for sure so he takes all of the money that he has which is not much because he's been spending it all on patsy as well as his wife divorcing him and taking most of the money but every single thing he has down to the last dime and he buys patsy a brand new Buick. So per gossip, when Bill gave Patsy her vehicle, she was super excited and super grateful. And of course they had a great night. And I'm sure that Bill did not want to ruin it by bringing up the marriage stuff again. So he just figured, hey, we'll have an engagement in like the next two nights. So I will just wait until we sing at this venue to bring up the question again. When it came time for them to sing again, Bill was nervous and he was just waiting for Patsy to show up to see if him buying the Buick had done the trick. And honey, let me tell you, it did do the trick. In fact, it turned into a full-on magic trick and made Patsy disappear. Yeah, Patsy had contacted somebody in the band earlier that day and told them she had quit. And next thing you know, Patsy took that car and left out of town, child. She ain't tried to divorce Gerald. I ain't even thought about divorcing Gerald. Child, the only thing she was worried about was getting to Washington, D.C. to get on the Cunny B. Gay show. Baby, they say Bill Peer was so doggone hurt that he broke down and cried like a baby. He had worked hard to get her where she was going to be. And Gossip claims that he was running around talking to his friends and he was just telling them, you know, I gave up everything for her. You know what I'm saying? I gave up my wife. I gave up my family for her. How dare she do me like this? And the only thing that he could think of is what his ex-wife told him. Be careful with that Virginia. She's going to use you and she's going to take everything you got and she's gonna leave you hanging. She done that mean any kind of way, but the truth was, ain't nobody told Bill Peer to go and divorce his wife and get caught and all this kind of stuff. She didn't do that. Now, when Patsy ended up starring on the Cunny B. Gay Show, she finally got her first real step at trying to be a star. First of all, people were finally able to put a face on a voice that they may have heard on the radio somewhere. And then Patsy knew what it took to stand out. While all of the other female and male singers just kind of stood there looking goofy, Patsy kind of had like some rhythm a little bit. You know what I'm saying? And when she was singing, she would sometimes do things with her hand. You know, even if it was just keeping a beat. Like, you know, she had a stage presence. So Patsy was killing it on that show. She was doing what she was supposed to do. And this was a great thing because her record deal at Four Star Records was not doing anything at 
all, honey. By this time, Patsy had put out uh, four songs, and them things was flopping like a doggone 1990s floppy disc, honey. And baby, the folks out here said that Patsy's TT lips was flopping just as hard. Honey, they said that Patsy got on the Cunny B Gay Show, baby, and got low, got low to the window, yay! To the wall! Because see, in 1955, she became a true regular on this show. And there were a lot of male singers, such as uh, Roy Clark, George Hamilton, Billy Grammer, and many, many more. As a matter of fact, Jimmy Dean was one of the singers. And yes, I mean Jimmy Dean from Jimmy Dean's Sausages. And Patsy enjoyed Jimmy Dean's Sausages very, very much. Baby, the folks say that she ate that sausage all the time and stuck it in different places. Who can with the sausage man, honey? And not only that, they claim she threw that thing at the singer Teddy Wilburn too. Once again, men were dropping at Patsy's feet like flies. Child, one of them men was a doggone bee instead of a fly, honey. And when Patsy came on to him, baby, he stung her so doggone hard, you know she was shamed. And his name was George Hamilton. And Patsy sat up there and tried to put them moves on him, baby. And George Hamilton was like, you know, no ma'am, I actually don't think that you're cute like everybody else does. Now, he did not say those exact words to her. He basically just let her know, like, no, I'm not interested. But um, he did some kind of interview or something like that, and he let the people know that while everybody else thought Patsy was all that, I just was not attracted to her like that. And he also went on to say that, like, Patsy was just flirting with everybody, child. Said that sometimes the men would have to kind of peel her off of them. You know, she was just a big flirt. And if she liked something, she just went to get it. Just like when George Hamilton told her no, baby, she walked right past him. And spotted a big, fine, muscular, lumberjack looking man. Said Patsy said, woo wee. I'ma screw the boots off of that big fella right there tonight. And then walked over to the guy and proceeded to screw the boots off of that big fella right there. And Patsy had to be ashamed of herself, child. Because uh, it's claimed that sometimes Gerald came to the set and, you know, it was embarrassing for him. He didn't know it, but everybody was looking at him like, you know, who's that? And uh, Patsy had not really let it be known that she was married and she didn't act like a married woman. So when he came to the set, a lot of people were surprised that she even was married. And the folks say that Gerald Klein knew that Patsy was doing all this to him, but he did not want to let her go. That is until he did not have a choice. And the cause of that was a Mr. Tall handsome, confident, and smooth, Charlie Dick. Now, Patsy was singing at a small club in Virginia when they went on intermission and Charlie Dick walked up to her. Patsy turns around and her breath gets caught in her throat. And it gets caught even more, honey, when Charlie smiles. Soon she must have realized that she looked like a love-struck fool, so she straightened up real quick, you know what I'm saying? You saw the regular brash Patsy come back around. Well, what's your name? And what do you want, Hawks? He very sweetly replied, well, my name is Charlie Dick, little lady, and I was wondering if I could have a dance. Nope, sorry, I'm working tonight, and I can't entertain no fellas while I'm working. And Charlie Dick says, well, all right, and walks off. Well, after this night, Charlie Dick came back to the club several times just to see Patsy, and on one of those nights, he saw her out there dancing with another guy. And this right here surprised Charlie a lot because, I mean, hey, he wasn't no James Dean, but doggone it, he looked better than this guy. And he comes back the next night, and he goes right up to Patsy, and he says, Hi, I would like to have a dance with you. Hoss, you got a lot of nerve. Didn't I tell you I couldn't entertain the fellas while I was working? Well, now you just hold on just a minute, Miss Klein. I saw you entertaining a fella last night. Oh, oh, so you did, did you? Well, you big dumbo, that was my husband. And of course, Charlie was sitting up there looking stupid after that, but he couldn't help but think in his mind, husband, how he, how he get you? But he couldn't say that, and he also couldn't stand there looking stupid because you know he was shamed. So he says, okay, but one more thing, you. Stop calling me horse. My name is Charlie. And Patsy is like, well, I call everybody horse. And he's like, I don't care. My name is Charlie Dick. And Patsy is like, whatever, you know, and she gets to walking off. And right when she gets to the stage, she looks over her shoulder and she says, well, nice to meet you, Charlie Dick. After that night, like, they just started hanging together. As a matter of fact, that night, they hung together the whole night, sitting in his car, talking and drinking. And Gossip claims that Patsy held out pretty good because it was the next night that Charlie got in them pants. Now, listen here, girl. I don't know what Charlie Dick had. 
But the man had something, child. They said the next day the patsy was just walking around with a rainbow over her head, honey. Sunshine, child. Said whenever somebody tried to talk to her, she was like, listen here, y'all. I have met me a young man with a hurricane in his pants. I am in love. I am for sure that he is the one for me. So within a few months, Patsy left Gerald Klein and Patsy Klein and Charlie Dick ended up getting married in 1957. And while things were hot and heavy with Charlie, Patsy's singing career was cold and lightweight, honey. I'm talking about skinny. Then she finally got a chance to boost her career. And that is when she was invited to appear on the Arthur Godfrey talent show. This was not no down home country local yeehaw type stuff. This was none of that. This was basically like national television. So this was a big deal. And y'all know I already kind of mentioned how Patsy's mother was the one who uh, made her costumes and her dresses. And the main costume that she used to wear was like a skirt and a top that was like had cowboy fringes hanging from it. You know, and she used to wear with her cowboy boots and her little hat. And I think it had like a little star or something like that. Baby, she pulled out that outfit to wear on that show. And her doggone record label called her so fast and was like, baby, I know you lying. You ain't finna wear that little country mess girl if you don't go find you some kind of little cocktail dress with some nice heels what's wrong with you think you're finna get on national tv embarrassing us and this upset patsy but if she thought this was a problem baby she was finna be 38 hot honey and that is because the record label told her we want you to sing the song walking after midnight and patsy had a fit whoever was standing beside her they pretty sure that they got cursed out because she was just so upset because she felt like why are you trying to make me sing walking after midnight that's like a blues pop type song no like the people want to hear country in the end though she goes out she stands in front of the piano the music starts and she starts to sing walking after midnight and the audience goes hush there may have been a few claps here and maybe somebody rocking but uh mostly everybody was just paying attention they were just caught up in it and as she starts to sing, the, I stop to see the weeping willow. The audience is absolutely transformed. And when Patsy stops singing, Walking After Midnight is their new favorite song. Patsy wins this competition with ease. Her new little catchy behind tune is a certified hit. And they hadn't even printed the first copy of this record as a single. But you better believe after that night, honey, them records started printing on their printing press like doggone doggone and it was great it was grand she was touring all over her record sales were through the roof people were giving her flowers after every show patsy patsy the whole world knew her name until suddenly they didn't unfortunately patsy klein could not follow up walking after midnight with any other hits and what's worse with her shoddy record deal that she signed the most she made was i believe ten thousand, and she used all of that money to pay off her mama's house after that she didn't have nothing as a matter of fact patsy was about to be walking after midnight uh before the midnight and during the midnight honey because the car she had was finna get repossessed her rent hadn't been paid in months some of the furniture that she was like uh renting to own or something like that even some of that was about to get uh taken away and so gossip claims that patsy was kind of calling around to borrow money and one of the people that she called was the owner of her record label and she's just like hey you know i just need like 500 dollars to make all of this stuff go away but the record label told her not -uh, no 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 i'm not gonna lend you any money but you can sign another contract for another two years and patsy was desperate she didn't have any money so she re-signed a shoddy contract for another two years. And you might be wondering, where is Charlie Dick in all of this? Where is Patsy's husband? Like, dang, they ain't even have no money to pay the rent. Well, baby, let me tell you something. That is the real tea of this video. The only place that Charlie Dick was, was where his was. Patsy thought that little mess about him having a hurricane in his pants was all cute until she found out that you never know where a hurricane might go and you can't control a hurricane. He was just doing the most. The relationship was very, very toxic. They fought all the time, especially when Charlie got drunk. It was one of those situations for Patsy where, uh, like Millie Jackson, you know what I'm saying? It hurts so good, you know what I mean? And there are plenty of stories about this crazy relationship, honey, and let 
let's get into some of them. Now, honey, listen to this. Now, the folks say that one time, Patsy and Charlie were driving down the street in Patsy's car. Well, this person that's telling the story says that they were walking and they turned to wave, but all they see are throwing hands, honey, just a whole bunch of slaps and busting upside the head. Y'all know how them little cartoons look when, like, they start fighting and rumbling and that smoke and stuff go everywhere? That's what it looked like in that car. And so the person is just kind of standing there looking, you know, and they kind of watch them on down the road. Well, they say as the car is inching down the road, suddenly Charlie's door goes open and he falls on the concrete. And it's not funny, I'm sorry. But the way they explained it, it was like he was just sitting in the car and then he just fell on the concrete. So it almost seemed like Patsy took her foot and just kicked him out of the car. So he just bloop, you know, fell on the ground. And then he got up cursing and screaming and trying to get back in the car, but she pulled off on him. This next rumor says that they were visiting Patsy and Charlie and uh, Patsy got mad at Charlie over something. I think maybe he didn't pour her a drink or something that she wanted him to do. And Patsy went off, honey. She started calling Charlie a nothing, a uh, broke as a joke. Honey told the man that he wasn't nothing but a tax write-off, baby, and said that he was barely worth that. And the folks say Charlie was just sitting up there looking shame. So they say one time, Patsy was at home cooking dinner or something like that. Charlie walks through the door and he had been drinking and Patsy is like, you know, how was your day? Well, Charlie just up and slapped her. So Patsy is like, you know, I'm sick of this. I'm not doing this anymore. So she calls the police and she's like, y'all, come get them. Come lock them up. And the police do their job. They come right over there and they haul Charlie behind off to jail. And uh, here go Patsy. <laughs> why they do that? Lord, why I call the police? My man is in jail. He don't need to be in there. The very next day when the jail opened up, Patsy was the first one there, honey, with bail money or whatever they was asking for. He got her man out and took him right back home with her. Some of the stuff that they said that they would get into it uh, for was just ridiculous. One time, they were making love, okay? And the loving got good, honey. And so Charlie says, baby, you take me halfway to heaven, girl. Said Patsy jumped up out of the bed and was like, uh, halfway? Who take you halfway so I don't take you all the way to heaven? Then there's this other piece of gossip that says that Patsy found out about Charlie sleeping with some woman around the town and uh, took a iron, honey, and bust him across the face with it, knocked him out. And y'all know them old school irons was heavy and steel and all that kind of stuff. Yes, honey. And uh, the folks say that this is who Patsy was. As a matter of fact, her family was said to have been mad about that movie they made about her. I think it was in the 80s or the 90s. Said that her family was upset about that movie because they said that the movie made Patsy look weak. Made it look like she was getting beat down, slapped to the floor all the time and all this kind of stuff. And that's not what it was. She prided herself on being able to stand up for herself and defend herself. She'd stand up for what she got to do. And if she got to tussle with her husband, that's what it is. So it was like they loved each other but they were just always arguing and Charlie's biggest problems outside of getting drunk and trying to hit on somebody was that he was always constantly cheating and it's claimed that this cheating really depressed Patsy. She couldn't understand why the man that she loved and finally wanted like for real while he was treating her that way and Charlie knew that he had Patsy on the string. He would do stuff to humiliate her. Gossip claims that there were many times and Patsy would be up on the stage singing and Charlie would be at the bar and entertaining other women, laughing with these other women, buying them drinks, kind of rubbing on these other women. And then towards the end of the night, when it was time to cash the receipts, Charlie would walk up to the stage or behind the stage, get the receipts or the cash that uh, Patsy made while she was singing, go back to the bar and make a plan to rent a hotel with this woman. So when the show was over, instead of him going back home or back to Patsy's hotel, she would just kind of go alone and he would be out, you know, saying, you know, I'm about to go hang out with the boys or I want to drink some more or whatever and he would go stay at another hotel room with whatever woman that he met at the bar like there are actual witnesses that say they saw this so the more that this happened the more depressed uh patsy got and she started to drink baby somebody claimed that one time she got so drunk they uh rode by her house that morning and patsy was sitting on the porch passed out drunk no panties on, TT out, and just like, just sitting there. So those are some of the tales, but anyways, soon after Patsy got married, she ended up being pregnant, and she gave birth to her daughter, Julie. Gossip claims that uh, one time while she was pregnant, she had a show, and she and Charlie were sitting backstage. Charlie was drinking, and then right before she was set to go out, he was like, um, I don't like this. Woman's supposed to be at home where her husband tell her to be. And Patsy is like, how we gonna make money, broke boy? I got to make money and sing. And so she started to walk off, and 
Charlie tries to stump behind her, but he is drunk, so he does not know that Patsy ends up turning off. His drunk tail thinks that she walks into a door that um is in front of him. So he keeps going straight and walks in the door. All you hear is, ah! He's walked into a uh, women's bathroom where a lot of the girls on the show were changing. And then on top of this, Charlie uses the baby as like a guilt thing. He's telling her, you know, what kind of mother are you? You know, you claim you love your child, but you're going out to sing on the road. You need to be here taking care of your baby. And so Patsy is really just having a dreadful time. But one of their main issues, like I said, is the money. And then one day, honey, Patsy thought God had reached down from heaven. Suddenly, Patsy started getting $100 checks like every week. Well, God wasn't nowhere in that mess, child. Come to find out that the military had got her address mistaken and they were sending her somebody else's money. So once the checks stopped coming, I think she had like six of them, so she had like $600 worth of checks. Her and Charlie started packing up all of their stuff and they went to the bank and they cashed the checks and then they got the heck out of Winchester, honey, because they just knew that the military or the officers was gonna come looking for them. Since they were running from the law, Patsy and Charlie ended up moving to Nashville. And this was wonderful because she ended up being able to connect with singer Farron Young and singing with his band, which gave her much more money. But baby, you know it's got to be some mess in there, honey. As soon as Farron Young got Patsy alone, he started rubbing up her leg and everything. And Patsy let him do it. But as soon as he got up to her face, she told him, don't you know I'm a married woman? I'm not about to do that with you. Embarrassed the heck out of that man, honey. Farron Young said he apologized and he was like, yes ma'am, you're right, we'll, we'll keep it professional. Now on top of Farron Young, Patsy Klein ended up meeting another man in Nashville and this meeting and this man would change her life forever. His name was Randy Hughes and he became her manager. And so he started booking Patsy magnificent shows. So Patsy's career was like getting back in the groove of things, but Charlie, oh crazy tail, was still acting a donkey. And then one day Patsy decided that she was done. And so when she gets home, you know, she marches in the house and she tells Charlie, you're trifling, you horrible, you a cheater, and I'm not doing this no more, Charlie Dick. It's over with for us. She walks out of the house and she is pregnant. Yes, child. Patsy and sat up there and said all that mess and ain't held up for one doggone minute before she was back in the bed with that man. And so uh, once she was pregnant again, uh, Charlie started to double down on his mistreatment of her. Now there are a lot of people out here that says no matter what, Charlie Dick loved his wife. And on his good days, he supported her to the fullest. But he did let her down a lot. And one of the biggest times he let her down was when she was giving birth to her second child, which was a son. Honey, listen at this. So gossip claims that Patsy Patsy, I believe, had a show that day or she was doing something and she started having stomach pains. So as soon as she got home that night, Charlie was not there. But Patsy did not let this worry her, you know what I'm saying? Her stomach ain't feeling good. So she lays down in the bed and she tries to go to sleep. Charlie finally comes home probably about one, two or three in the morning and he plops down in the bed beside her. Well, probably about 20 minutes after that, Patsy starts to feel labor pains. She's like, Charlie, Charlie, you know I'm about to have the baby. Charlie turned around and looked at her and said, you just trying to guilt trip me because I was out all night. I'm not going to apologize for being out doing what I do. And promptly fell right back into a drunken stupid. Patsy looked at him. She just shook her head in disgust and she said, you know what? I'm not even going to try. I'm not even going to argue with him. So she gets up and she calls a friend and her friend and her friend's husband drove all the way over there and picked Patsy up to take her to the hospital. Even though her husband was right there laying in the bed with her and would not get up to take his wife to the hospital, child. Then the folks got the nerve to say that after several hours, Charlie wakes up and like rushes down to the hospital talking about some, uh, where's my boy? Where's my boy? And Patsy did indeed give birth to a boy. And this right here leads into two other rumors, honey. Because one rumor says that Patsy was so upset with the way that Charlie had behaved and not taking her to the hospital that when her baby was born, she named the baby Randy after her manager out of spite. Second rumor says that she named the baby Randy because it was Randy Hughes' baby. Baby said Randy had been tapping that eye 
almost like a month after they uh, met. Like he had been tapping it ever since then. So I don't know, honey. Y'all tell me what y'all think. So in 1961, I Fall to Pieces was recorded. And at first, it seemed like Patsy had missed the mark again. And Patsy really was hoping for a miracle. And the miracle that she was going to get was wrapped up in a curse. So gossip claims that Patsy and her brother Sam are just driving to the store. And out of nowhere, a car that's coming this way, you know, they're going this way, the car is coming this way. Well, a car comes from behind this car and tries to pass on a two lane road and slams head on into Patsy and her brother. Patsy went through the windshield and was immediately looking like Skeletor child because the windshield had uh, ripped her skin back from right here all the way back. And on top of the whole Skeletor thing, she had a whole bunch of broken bones. It was a really, really bad accident. And when Patsy woke up in the hospital, she was bandaged everywhere. Where her head was wrapped up, her leg was wrapped up, and she stayed in the hospital for at least a month. But while she was in the hospital, I Fall to Pieces had moved far up the chart. In fact, it turned into a complete hit, the biggest song that Patsy had had thus far. Now, she was not necessarily a country music star, but she was show sure enough bona fide. After she got out of the hospital, I think she had to stay home for like six weeks just to let her uh, wounds and stuff heal. She did, however, start having to wear a band around her head, like a tight band to kind of hold everything together. And so she was a little iffy about that, but the fact that her song had become a hit had lightened Patsy in so many ways. You know, it was kind of like her spirit from when she was younger was finally coming back. That money started coming in. So Patsy was back with her sense of humor. Chade said one time, she was on a plane and the pilot told everybody okay guys fasten your seatbelts Patsy crazy tail gonna jump in the middle of the plane aisle and say you heard the man ladies y'all fasten your sanitary belts and everybody's just like red face people are giggling nobody knows what to do and the flight attendant is like rushing down the aisle you know ma'am have a seat have a seat just a big ruckus and if you guys don't know what sanitary belts are like that's how the uh, sanitation they didn't have tampons and stuff like that you know what I'm saying they had these big old pads and they used to wear belts with them like you had to hook it up to a belt to keep it up then you have this other story where Patsy Patsy had a gig out of town and so she was staying in the hotel and she was actually in a hotel room with a whole bunch of male singers and so they're all just sitting in there talking and drinking and stuff and then Patsy says okay boys get out your condoms and so you know the guys are kind of like you know shook and she's like pull them out and so they start like pulling out condoms you know not knowing what's going on she runs and takes the condoms and go fills them up with water open the uh, hotel window and starts dropping water balloon condoms on people's heads. Then you have this other story, which is a weird, weird story, but Patsy was doing some type of show in like the backwoods town, like it was a real, real country town, wasn't any hotels around. So uh, she and Randy were actually going to stay with a local family. Well, when they get to the family's house after the show, it's really, really dark. It's even probably past midnight or whatever. So they uh, pull up to the house and they're getting out of the car and they're walking to the front door. And so they started hearing like a little tsk, tsk, tsk. so they're kind of looking around scared not knowing what's going on and they trying to like you know hurry up and get to the door well patsy ends up tripping over something and then when she composes herself it's a wang in her face now it was just for a split second because the person ended up covering it up real quick but uh what happened was the teenage boy that lived at that house was outside uh jacking some jack honey and that was the squish sound that they had heard um so anyways the boy was so embarrassed and startled that he jumps up and he says uh my brother's got a good tar he loves Loved you, Patsy, and then took off running to the house. But then listen at this, honey. The folks say that Patsy started kind of feeling herself a little bit when I Fall to Pieces was uh, rising up the charts. So now she would come to these gigs and she would bust out these blonde wigs or these red wigs. She would wear all this makeup all over her face. And child said the folks backstage was laughing at that woman, child. Honey said them folks was calling her Ronald McDonald, child. Said her makeup looked like a clown and her wigs did too. And if you are saying that she was wearing those wigs to cover that band, that's a lie because even before the wreck, it is claimed that Sometimes when Patsy gigged, she would have on these uh, weird wigs, like just, you know, blonde, just different colors that didn't really suit her or people just wasn't used to it. That's all. So anyways, Patsy was having a whole lot of fun. And then her icing on the cake came in 1962 when she was finally able to buy herself a house. And it was just money coming in from everywhere. And Charlie even went and got himself a couple of cars. She was just finally living the life. But you could count on Charlie. Charlie Dick to mess 
it up. He still continued to make Patsy's life a living hell. Still kept cheating on her, accusing her, and all kind of stuff like this. There was one gig she did out of town. Well, Charlie decided to call Patsy and cut up and act a fool just like always. So Patsy understood that it was never going to be enough no matter what she did. She was never going to be able to please this man. It was just impossible. And so she cried and she cried with every step she took. She got into the hotel room, you know, she was just a crime taking off her clothes and the whole time Farron Young is sitting on the bed wondering what's going on he don't know what to think and finally he finds his tongue and he's like Patsy what are you doing this is my room what you doing taking off your clothes and Patsy turned around with all them tears streaming down and she was like no I'm Farron no I'm not going nowhere Charlie accused me of sleeping with you let's give him what he wants and Farron is like no Patsy you know I tried to make that move on you the first time when we first met but you know it's strictly business no Patsy get the H out of here and Patsy is like uh-uh no uh-uh we about to make this happen, big boy. I'm about to make your dreams come true and Charlie's dreams. He keeps accusing me. We about to do this thing. And then she jumped on Fair and Young. And I don't know if the man tried to get away or not, honey. All I know is that uh, she made Charlie and his dreams come true. What? Cha. After this, Patsy was a new woman, honey. She had a new walk. She had a new talk. She was self-assured. She was getting her power back. And then the studio burst her little bubble by telling her that they wanted her to sing a song called Crazy. And Patsy once again was furious. What kind of song is this? Give me an upbeat song. You know, I'm feeling good. I don't want to sing no dreary stuff talking about crazy and all this kind of stuff. And the studio was like, listen, Patsy, you get a little bit of leniency here, but, but hey, this song Crazy, we want you to sing it so you will sing it. And so Patsy gets into the studio and all of those emotions that she thought she had gotten away from you know what I mean all of that stuff she thought she had put out of her head because she had gotten her power back she wasn't worried about Charlie well while she was singing this song crazy all of those emotions came back to her she realized that she really loved this guy she could not get her husband out of her system and she was crazy over him and so she sang with such passion that she uh recorded the song in one take and she was having pains from her wreck you know everything started aching but she was still singing that's how much passion she had in her voice for this song and it came over just like that the the, the feelings that she felt the emotion the passion women who heard this song around the world felt that same way they felt a sister crying out because you know her life her heartbreak it was terrible for her and then child speaking of crazy honey I got to listening to it baby it almost took me back Child, I almost bust my husband upside the head for some stuff he done some years ago. Sure, I let it go. So anyways, Patsy Cline is a shooting star. She is busy, 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 and soon she has a residency in Vegas. And her mother made sure that she made Patsy something fabulous for the occasion. It was an almost floor length black sequence dress that hugged Patsy's figures and showed her curves. She wore it with these grand high heels and when she arrived, she was wrapped in a fur. She looked like the superstar that she was. And now that Patsy had really made it to where she was trying to get to her whole freaking life, there was a certain attitude change that came over her, like almost a certain calm that came over her. Her and Charlie did definitely have their arguments. I mean, somebody uh, told a story about when they went to Patsy's house and they stood outside the door because Patsy was cussing Charlie out and them kids, child. I guess they was getting on her nerves. Baby said that they saw Patsy yank up her daughter and all that kind of stuff because I think her daughter was disobeying or something like that. So anyways, like I said, there were still arguments. But uh, it's almost like Patsy just kind of accepted things that this is the way it was, you know what I mean? She also started to give away her clothes, her old dresses. I think she even gave away her cowboy uh, dress outfit or something like that. I think she may have given that to Loretta Lynn. And yes, that's Loretta Lynn, the country singer that Patsy had just met in 1961. And baby, the reason I say this is because gossip claims that Loretta Lynn did a whole bunch of lying. Now the folks say that they were friends. 
but um, it is claimed that their friendship was nothing like Loretta Lynn acts like it is. Then when folks were sitting up there kind of questioning her about it, she had the nerve to say, well, uh, you know, I'm saying that, you know, Patsy was my best friend, but I never said I was Patsy's best friend. But anyways, like I said, Patsy was ending up giving away her clothes. She just started saying things like, you know, I finally done what I said I was gonna do. She also started saying things like, you know, third time's the charm, y'all. You know, I had that fever, almost took me out. I had that wreck, I survived it. You know, what's gonna happen next? Third time's the charm, y'all. Either I'm gonna live and I'm gonna go off scot-free or I'm gonna die. Whatever kind of premonitions she was having, it does seem like she really was having these things because Patsy Klein changed her will. And the folks say that the only thing she left her husband, Charlie, was a car child. I said that he wasn't finna touch her stuff. So I don't know how true it is, but yeah. So on March the 3rd, 1963, Patsy ended up performing in Kansas and gossip claims that while she was on the stage she ended up like you know kind of tearing up and just thanking everybody she was so thankful thank you all you know without your help I would have never made it to where I am so I'm so grateful thank you she gave three performances that day one at two o'clock one at like 5 15 and I think like the last one at like 8 15 or 8 30 and on the last performance she wore this beautiful white dress. It was made out of chiffon and her hair was just laid. She looked great. After the show, Patsy was in a huge rush to get home because her baby boy, Randy, had the flu or a real bad cold or something like that. And um, he was very sick and you know, and then also his father, Charlie, had called her and was like, you know, he's a crying and he misses his mommy. He needs his mommy here with him, making Patsy feel even more guilty. You know, so she really wanted to get home to her children. She loved her children. But unfortunately, she was not able to fly out that night or even the next day on on March 4th because the weather was bad. But also on that day of March 4th, Dottie West, who was another singer, told Patsy that she and her husband were about to drive to Tennessee. 16 hour drive and they told Patsy that, you know, you're free to ride with us. And Patsy was going to ride with them, but then she's like, you know what? I'm not gonna leave Randy like that. You know, I flew here with them. I'm gonna fly back with them, you know. And then also, once everything clears, we will get back faster than you guys anyway because we are flying. Well, it ended up not clearing up that whole day. So on uh, March 3rd and the 4th, Patsy could not go anywhere. So on March the 5th, Patsy called her mother at around 12 something p.m. and she asked about her children, you know, and her mother told her everything was fine. And Patsy was like, you know, mom, I'm trying to get home. I'm ready to get home, but the weather is bad, but it looks like it's going to clear up. So we should be flying out soon. And word on the streets is that somebody told her, you know, Patsy, y'all probably need to think twice about getting on that plane. But Patsy said, you know, I'm not worried about a horse. When it's my time, it's my time. Ain't nothing I can do to stop but I'll be all right. So I'm guessing right around 1 p.m. on March 5th, Patsy Klein, Randy Hughes, her manager, Hawkshaw Hawkins, a singer, and Cowboy Copas, another singer, got on board a Piper PA-24 Comanche plane, and they took off from Kansas. They made a short stop at Arkansas to refuel, and when they were about to leave on the plane again, the weather was bad. So they waited a little while, waited a little while, and then as soon as the weather cleared a little bit, the plane took off for that last leg at around 6.07 p.m. At 6.15 p.m., allegedly, Bill Peer was in Brunswick, Maryland, and Faye Crutchley said to him, Oh God, Bill, I miss Patsy, don't you? And Bill Peer supposedly said, What? Are you serious? Miss her? Miss Klein can fall to pieces for all I care. And he was saying this in regards to her song, I Fall to Pieces, and also because he had bought her that car and she had left him, but uh, supposedly he said this. So that was said at 6.15 p.m. At 6.20 p.m., Farron Young was in his office and uh, the picture of Jan Howard as well as Patsy Klein fell off the wall, both of them. So Farron Young picks up the phone and he calls Jan Howard at home and she's like, what's wrong? And he's like, oh, okay, Jan, I've gotten a hold to you. Well, then that must mean it's Patsy. And he started trying to call and get a hold to Patsy, but of course he could not because at that very moment, Patsy's plane was falling out of the sky. Randy Hughes trusted himself a bit too much. He was a pilot with some flight experience, but he was not a pilot that could read 
instrument he always just saw with his eyes you know because he was flying like a low level plane that you can fly low and see the land and all this good stuff so um when bad weather came though those clouds those lightning strikes the rain you can't see anything and he did not know how to use the instrument randy hughes thought he was flying straight when he was actually flying directly to the ground most people think that the weather was just bad and the plane started getting bumpy you know and so uh patsy and everybody else is like ah you know what's going on and so in the midst of their panicking and people being scared randy must have just gotten turned around you know maybe he thought he was still going straight but again he was not he was diving to the ground and he was going just like this. He did not see what was going on until the top of the trees came into view. He tried to pull up, but by that time it was over with. One of the wings had clipped one of the trees and then the plane just like, just was going crazy, you know, blah, 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 all through the trees and stuff like that. And um, sadly, everybody on board perished. And this is a warning because it's about to get a little disturbing right here. But gossip claims the next day when they did locate the wreck, they could not identify anybody except Patsy Klein. She was the only person who had whole enough body parts where they could identify her. Everybody else was just like almost splatter. Like you really couldn't find anything. There was flesh hanging around. It was really bad. Um, once again, warning, but for the people who do want the details, Patsy's torso was found stuffed under a log and attached to her torso was half a head. And I'm not talking about cut horizontally. I'm talking about cut diagonally. So half of one side of her head and the other side was like just somewhere else. And they also found her foot, which was in a tree. It was actually like and sitting in a tree crook just like that and the only reason they knew it was her foot is because it had fingernail polish on the toenail people have referred to this day as the day that country music died but then get this child a lot of folks think this is kind of spooky because country music singer jack anglin had went to hawkshaw hawkins funeral he went to the copas funeral because all of these funerals uh were all on the same day okay so again he went to hawkins funeral he went to copas funeral and before he went to to Patsy's funeral. He went to the barbershop to get his hair cut because he had a little bit of time. Well, the haircut took longer than he expected. So he tried to speed to get to Patsy's funeral and he ended up running off a ramp and slamming into a ditch or a tree or something like that. But that took his life. So, you know, it was pretty weird that these three people would die in a plane crash and then another country music artist would die on the way to Patsy Cline's funeral. And Patsy Cline did not live a long life. She was only 30 years old when she she passed away but she definitely left her mark in fact she opened the doorway she changed the game for female country music singer and this is the end of the old hollywood scandalous tale of miss patsy klein i hope you guys enjoyed it if you did go ahead and click the like and subscribe button if you are new here love you guys so much and i will see you guys soon with another video bye